Hello and welcome to Enchantment of Eternity's review for Star Trek Discovery Season 2. In this video I will cover all of Season 2 and my overall thoughts of Season 2 of Star Trek Discovery as a whole. So I have to start of course with the spoiler warning for Season 2 up to the very end of Season 2. If you haven't seen all of Season 2 you will not want to watch this video. Otherwise some things will be spoiled for you. So, Season 2 of Star Trek Discovery. This is a hard one because I've, I don't know, I've prided myself on always being a bit more positive on Discovery than others. Some might refer to me as a Discovery Defender. But it does seem like there's a lot of people who are more positive on this season than I am. Because I think... You know, don't get me wrong, I like Discovery, and I wasn't one of those people trashing it, saying it's not Star Trek, or wanting it to be cancelled, or anything like that. I'm glad it's still going, I'm glad it got a Season 3, I think this is a decent show. I think it has a lot of potential, and that's what I said about Season 1, that I it didn't work out the best, but it had a lot of potential, and some of the production issues that were having, you know, happening behind the scenes were definitely apparent, uh, in the uh, in season one and what ended up on the screen, and I would say the same thing is true of season two because season two also had production issues. They uh, had new sh uh, showrunners got fired like halfway through, and they had new showrunners, and uh, it seems like things were like in a state of flux, um, and they were running uh, over budget and whatnot. And I think all this showed up in. A discovery as well. Now, what I will say about season two is that this was a very bipolar season. It had some really high highs, but really low lows. And what I will say about season two is that the high highs were definitely higher than anything in season one. I think season two was more consistently good, and when it was good, it was that uh, much better. And I was like super impressed. There were points in time when uh, Discovery Season 2 was being so good, I, you know, was being optimistic that the rest of the season would keep up this tone and this would end up being an absolutely amazing season. Unfortunately, uh, that wasn't the case. <laughs> Whenever uh, they got that high, they eventually crashed and they were never able to maintain it. So unfortunately, it did not uh, finish as one of the best seasons ever. And what I said about season one a lot was, uh, again, because the Mirror Universe arc was so good, but season one had really horrible pacing because it was too slow at the beginning, too rushed at the end. Uh, whereas season two, I don't think the issue would be categorized as pacing as much as structure. The structure seemed to be all over the place because there's other like seasons of Star Trek that I would describe as bipolar. That are some episodes are really great and some episodes are really bad. I think uh, season six of Star Trek Voyager is a good example of this, and even maybe even season six of Deep Space Nine. Although Deep Space Nine season six is probably one of my favorite seasons uh, of any Star Trek show. So their high highs are <laughs> totally outweighed any of the negatives. And their negatives actually weren't that bad with one exception. <laughs> Where I, so I think season two Discovery, I would more closely compare it to like season six of Voyager where it was very hit or miss. Uh, I was going back and forth. But even with that season, I think they were, it had me think of it more favorably because the highs were higher. What I think hurts uh, Season 2 of Discovery in this regard is that I don't think it is, has enough room to go back and forth in quality like this because of the serialized nature of it. Because this is basically telling one story. So that's why, you know, Season 6 of Voyager can get away with it because it was a lot more episodic. So if this storyline sucked... This week, don't worry, because next week is a totally different storyline uh, that has to do with them finding a planet where time is moving super fast. And then next week, you get a shitty storyline about, you know, some people, uh, con artists impersonating the Voyager crew, which isn't so good. So, since these episodes, those episodes were so standalone, it was able to sort of, I'm able to forgive it more and focus more on the positive. The issue with Discovery is that it had a couple of ongoing storylines and that were lasting throughout the season and they seemed a bit 
jumbled. They seem to not really be very cohesive, and I think this is the behind-the-scenes production issues uh, coming in. Now, it did tell one story, the one main story that lasted the whole season, which was about the, uh, the Red Signals and the Red Angel. Uh, that was the overarching story. But within it, you had a lot of ongoing micro-stories. And I think if these were kind of confused, and they were kind of going up and down, and I don't think they were structured very well. So when I look back on the season as one whole, I think it's a bit of a mess. <laughs> I think it's a bit of ill-structured, with some really great moments there, and some really terrible moments there. Uh, so, um, yeah, <laughs> have mixed feelings about season two. But let's uh, let me get into some more specifics of season two. So let me start with that. Let me start with the structure of the season. So you have uh, the red signals are introduced. I said that they detected seven of them uh, that are you know that they're going to be seven, but they only detected the first one. So they're looking for these signals, and that's the mission that they're on. And so when they're on this mission, they encountered uh, the Red Angel, and they learn more about it and how the Red Angel has been sort of affecting history and saving people. So that's another uh, mystery introduced. Also, they find out that Spock is wanted for murder, so they're trying to find them, and uh, Section 31 is trying to find them too, so it's like a race to see who can find Spock. And then they encounter the sphere that has apparently all the data on the universe because it's been around for what millions of years or thousands of years or whatever according to all the data so pretty much knows everything and it downloaded itself into discovery so then discovery has this all important data and then you got uh uh, we find out that control which is an ai that section 31 uses has become sentient basically and is taking over uh, section 31 and is basically trying to wipe out humanity we find out eventually in the future it wipes out all sentient life in the universe so uh it becomes something that needs to be uh defeated and then we find then they find out that the red angel uh is actually michael burnham's mother and later they find out it's actually also michael burnham as well and they also uh, find have to get time crystals because they come up with a plan to go into the future uh, to hide uh, discovery in the sphere data from control and then they end up uh, defeating control and then uh, setting the timeline straight so they're going back and said Michael Burnham is the one who sets all the red, red signals so she sets them up and then discovery goes into the future um, so that that was the basic structure uh, of the season, and I think I don't know. I, I think it gets it gets a bit jumbled. Like they have, um, I don't think it flows as well as it should. Um, yeah, <laughs> I think they could have done a better job. So that's the basic structure. But now let me also get into some of the storyline that are within season two because there's a lot there's what there's storylines that have one that take place in one episode or some storylines that are over arch uh over the whole season so you got uh them going to the asteroid to rescue uh jet renault uh, and then you have they're going to a planet called terra elysium where one of the signals send them to a second one does and they uh that plants and has a human colony that was saved from world war three whatever they've been there for hundreds of years and they have to save them from destruction and then you have to deal with the klingon empire the whole thing with uh the the empress having to assert her control and her you know her apparently having a baby with ash tyler evoke and they have to hide the baby or whatever and the baby ends up going to this monastery where it becomes an adult and they meet it later on uh and also uh the storyline about them trying to prove spock's innocent because burnham and spock are, are and pike are convinced that uh he's innocent while second 31 is convinced he's guilty and then there's a storyline with saru discovering his origins where he learns that he's been lied to the whole time, that he's not actually prey, he's a predator, and that his people are being oppressed uh, by the this alien species, so they have to defeat them. 
and uh, you know, and free uh, the Kelpians. And then there's a whole storyline with the Marseille network. There's these aliens that feel like they're being hurt by Stamus every time that he uses the spore drive and they reach out to Tilly for help. And so she eventually has to go into the network to save these aliens. Uh, and uh, Discovery goes to save her. And of course, there's also the storyline of Section 31 how. Uh, Cornwell orders Pike to work with Section 31, and, and but they're still up to no good, and they don't get along, and they're constantly fighting, and eventually Section 31 is taken over by uh, the AI control, and there's a storyline where Spock goes to Talos 4, where he's not allowed, but the Talosians help him regain his sanity and fix his problem, and uh, put uh, Burnham and the others on the right path, and also you got the personal conflict between Spock and Burnham, uh, siblings who, you know, have this childhood issues that they have to work through. And then you got Control. They find out that Control is trying to take over and trying to kill him. Takes over Arium, so they have to kill her. And they're trying to take over uh, Discovery in order to get to the Sphere data. Uh, then we find out Burnham encounters her mother, who's the Red Angel. And she thought she was dead, and she learns that her mother created the suit with Section 31, there's this whole backstory, but her mother doesn't want to cooperate, and they end up destroying her time crystal. And then you have Pike going to the Klingon Monastery to get a new time crystal, but he has to uh, choose this dark path, accept this destiny, which is him getting you know paralyzed in that funky wheelchair in order to do so. So he does that, and then Discovery, coming up with a plan for Discovery to go to the future, so they can get the sphere data away from control because there's no way to destroy the sphere data. And then Burnham realizes that she's a red angel, so she goes back and it sets the signals and Discovery goes in the future. And then, of course, Pike and Spock on the Enterprise and all of them covering it up and pretending that Discovery's been destroyed. So those are basically the storylines within that structure. And again, I think these, these storylines... <laughs> They don't really work, if you know what I'm saying. Like, a few of them do. Like, I love the Telosian storyline and the Terralesium storyline. So some that are sort of stand more standalone. But then, like, some of the overarching storylines, it seems like they did out of a sense of obligation, particularly the Marcial Network and the creatures that... Uh, looking back on the season as a whole, that's felt like a, a big aside and uh, didn't really help uh, tell... Didn't really add anything to the season, basically. I think it's it sort of was a distraction uh, that didn't help. And I think the overall story of Control uh, was not handled very well. Plus, if you watch my uh, episode reviews, you know that I totally did not like Section 31. First of all, uh, they're not like the Section 31 that's been established in Star Trek. Uh, regardless of any excuse saying, oh, they didn't be, they weren't like this, you know, uh, in Deep Space Nine, they were established to be, like, very secretive, no one's heard of them, and the excuse is, oh, well, they're just like that here, but a hundred years later, they'll go underground, and no one will hear of them, so they'll change, but that's bullshit, <laughs> because it has been established in Deep Space Nine Enterprise that Section 31 were always that way, and in fact, no one in 100 years had heard of Section 31, if Discovery, the events of Discovery were true, then people would have heard of Section 31. They'd be like, oh, that's that old intelligence agency that used to be around 100 years ago. So, now, I usually don't complain about canon violations, don't get me wrong, because there's, you know, several issues when it comes to that. But that one in particular just irks me. main reason why it irks me is because... I don't mind that they change it as much as they mind they change it to make it worse. Because if they treated Section 31 the way they were in Deep Space Nine, then this would be a lot more interesting. I actually thought they, they were rather goofy uh, in Season 2, quite frankly. And I think uh, some of the, you know, the character stories of Ash Tyler... And, and Giorgio, it just did not work for me at all. So that was a that was a huge <laughs> negative for me. And then control is up and down because when they first introduced control, especially when it took over Arium 
and I uh, was trying to take over Discovery. It was very menacing. It was uh, used as a very good suspenseful tool. But once Control started taking over Leland and taking over Section 31, it just became like a surrogate for Section 31. And its powers were very dependent on the plot, in my opinion. It could do whatever the plot required it to do. There was a lot of plot contrivance. As far as I'm concerned, uh, whenever dealing with control, particularly in those later uh, episodes. Uh, so, uh, and by the time we got to the final battle in the final episode, I lost interest. I was not interested in control because its control was so, it was so loose in defining what it was, it was no longer believable. It felt more like a plot contrivance than a, a tangible threat. Uh, if you know what I'm saying. And, and so when, it, you know, it showed up and all of a sudden it had all these ships come out and it was like, oh, we have a lot more ships than you all of a sudden. Like, that just felt, it didn't feel earned. Nothing about the storyline towards the end anyway felt earned, so it lost my interest uh, in it entirely. And also the storyline with the Red Angel, I think, was a wash. I think the revelation of who the Red Angel was uh, was not very good because this is something they were teasing and withholding throughout the entire season. Who's the Red Angel? Who's the Red Angel? What is it? And their common fan theory online was that it was uh, Michael Burnham herself or a future version of her. And I know a lot of people, including myself, did not want that to be the case. In fact, we're saying if that's the case, it will suck. Now, they tried to fake his out and be like, make us think it wasn't Michael Burnham when they introduced it was Michael Burnham's mother, but we found out later that uh, it actually was Michael Burnham. <laughs> that Michael Burnham's mother only started it and only had, like, appearances uh, from, like, Spock's childhood or Burnham's childhood. And all the recent appearances of the Red Angel was, in fact, Michael Burnham herself. Uh, so, and I think that was very unimaginative. I think it puts her, and plus they even had lines about, oh, Michael, you know, you're what's important. Control wants to kill you because you're the important thing. You're what's important. Um... And I don't think that worked. <laughs> I, I, I honestly don't think that worked. And uh, I think they could have done... I wasn't interested in the character of Michael Burnham's mother at all. Personally, I don't think we had enough backstory. It's also a retcon because she was established to be killed in season one. Now, it doesn't directly contradict anything from season one. They go out of their way to try to make it make sense. But that doesn't make it any less of a retcon. It's obvious that uh, it, it, they hadn't thought of it in season one. And now let me be clear, because some people always misunderstand me when I'm saying this. I'm not saying that it's bad because they hadn't thought of it in season one. I'm not saying that it's bad because they hadn't thought of it in season one. I'm saying it's bad because it's obvious that they hadn't thought of it in season one. That's the difference. That's a huge difference some people know because I know some people will be like, oh, some people make stories up as they go along, like Breaking Bad makes it up as they go along, or whatever. That's fine. You can make it up as you go along as long as it's not obvious that you're doing it. Like Breaking Bad is not obvious they're doing it. I had no idea. It seems like they had it all planned, but they don't because they're so good at making it up as they go along. This is not good as they're making it up as going along because it's obvious because it's... It's obviously a retcon. Uh, it's just jarring, even if it doesn't actually contradict anything specifically. Uh, and the other thing with Control, and why Control is not a good villain, is because its motivations were very jarring, or very unclear, I should say. And its capabilities, again, were whatever the plot needed to be. Sometimes it came up off as too much of a Mary Sue. That's right, I'm calling Control Mary Sue, not Burnham, because it seemed uh, all-powerful when it needed to be and not powerful when it, the plot required it not to be. And, yeah, its motivations were unclear. It wanted the sphere data so it could become sentient, but it was already sentient, wasn't it? It could think, it could act, it could imitate human behavior, it could manipulate humans emotionally. How's that not sentient? Uh, well, I think what they're saying is it required, if it had the knowledge of the sphere, to have all the knowledge everywhere so it would be able to wipe out all sentient life because so it wouldn't need anyone anymore. But that's not what they kept saying. They kept saying, oh, want to be sentient, but it's not sentient. And the, so the, that whole storyline uh, 
was a bit jumbled. <sighs> yeah, and so what else did we have? Oh yeah, the Klingon storyline, that was rushed through uh, very quickly, so I didn't really care about that. I think they kind of wanted to get the Klingons over with because they're not popular, but I, I think doing it half-assedly is not the answer uh, to that. Uh, but... The some storylines I really did like, uh, like uh, the specific storylines, specific episodes, like going to Terra Elysium, that was fascinating. Rescue Reno from the asteroid, it was super intense. Uh, the Telosians, uh, that was an amazing storyline. I, I couldn't believe how well that they uh, matched this up to the events that were already in canon through the cage. It was so great seeing the aliens again. The reason why it was so great is because they stayed true to their characters. They added to the story. Their interactions with Spock made total sense. Uh, it was so great seeing Vina, who was there when, when Talos IV, uh, react with Pike because it's it sets up perfectly that Pike is going to spend the rest of her life with her. And those scenes uh, with them... Uh, was very uh, touching, and I also liked Pike going to uh, to choose his destiny to take the time crystal, even though it meant that he would be in the wheelchair. And I actually think it was pretty cool that they were able to show us that moment uh, that was only talked about before, where he got burned in the fire, and they and it was such a creepy scene where he was screaming, and you could tell Pike was interacted, affected by that. So don't get me wrong, there were some storylines. Uh, that really worked uh, this season. Uh, so, so basically, the high points of the season were definitely the episode eight, if memory serves, when they went to Talos IV. Uh, that was probably, I think, the best episode in the entire show so far. Uh, I thought that everything about that episode worked. They nailed it out of the park. Another high point is uh, the next episode, Project Daedalus. Uh, where they um, went to the Section 31 headquarters and they found out Control was marrying them and uh, Arium had took over Control and they tried to kill her and she had said they did such a great job of establishing a story arc for Arium in that one episode by the time it ended and Burnham had to kill her. That was such a powerful moment because it play, it was such a good character moment for Burnham because it played into her uh, ability to not want to let go. Um, and another good episode was, uh, episode two, uh, New Eden, again, the Terra Elysium thing, uh, that was very fascinating, it felt like classic track, it felt like it could be a Next Generation episode, it really worked, I also liked the first episode of the season, Brother, I think that was really suspenseful, I think it set the stage, uh, nicely for what was going, and I actually liked the episode, uh, an obol for Sharon, uh, the episode where they encounter the sphere data, and they think that Burnham, uh, that uh, sorry, Saru is going to die, and then Burnham and Saru were sort of saying goodbye, and they had these really nice character moments uh, that I thought worked really well uh, for the show. Plus, I thought the the uh, dilemma of the sphere and them trying to deal with it, and the Universal Translator being taken over, this whole like setup, this whole storyline felt very classic. Uh, like TNG, DS9 to me. It felt like the good Star Trek stuff that makes Star Trek really great. Uh, so I would say that was definitely a high point as well. Uh, as I said, I liked the episode through the, sh the Valley of Shadows when Pike encounters the crystals. I thought that was done very well. Now, <laughs> low points of the season to me. Uh, well, definitely Point of Light episode 3. Uh, probably the worst, if not the second to worst episode where they dealt with the clans. It felt like they were just pushing pieces forward. I had no connection with the characters whatsoever. Um, yeah, what else is it? The, I mean, I suppose the episode, uh, Sound of Thunder, where they do with Sauru's homeworld, like, that was okay, but I thought that first episode felt a bit rushed. Like, they were trying to do too much. Uh, in that one episode and trying to just things just felt a bit rushed to move forward a bit too quickly um yeah and the episode of course saints of imperfection that dealt with the uh, sport drive i mean that was okay but it felt kind of unearned uh and probably yeah episode 10 the red angel 
I did not care about Burnham and her mother and their interactions. Oh, and this goes for the next episode, sorry, uh, P- uh, Perpetual Infinity. When Burnham and her mother were interacting, I did not care about them at all. And the Red Angel, I thought, was a, a silly fake out when they were saying that uh, they came up with this plan to trap the Red Angel. Uh, which seems like they should have just left the Red Angel alone. <laughs> it seems like they were being arrogant and, and fucking up. And, of course, I did not like... Uh, the season two finale, Such Sweet Sorrow. Uh, I went on a 45-minute, like, detailed video, or 50-minute detailed video about how uh, flawed this episode is and how it was a huge disappointment to me. They spent a half an hour on this uh, battle, which was way too drawn out. I had no uh, investment in it. I described it as explosion diarrhea. Uh, there was no sort of geography to the fight. It felt very chaotic and uh, just not interesting. And they had a lot, a lot of horrible dialogue with uh, security chief going yum yum. <laughs> what the fuck is that? And and the um, the long goodbyes were it, it were too like too long. Uh, they they had like they could have done these scenes great if they kept it short and succinct, but they always overdid it. And I think that's the case throughout the entire season with episodes like Such Sweet Sorrow when they're all saying goodbye and Detmer's writing a letter to their father saying goodbye or uh, the Red Angel episode where they have this overly long funeral and everyone says it's something and the sorrow sings and it's a funeral for a character we don't even know and, and don't care about that much. Um, and it's a theme throughout the season and it's definitely one of the biggest flaws of season two is that they overdo the melodrama where it hasn't really been earned. Uh, they didn't earn <laughs> earn this melodrama, and they overdo it. Uh, maybe they did that a little bit with Saru when he was about to die, but I kind of liked that. I thought that kind of worked. But it's not just that they overdid it there. It's the fact that they keep doing it, and they keep doing it. And Burnham's supposed to be like a Vulcan-like, but she's constantly <laughs> crying. A lot of people pointed this out. And I think if you're going to do... <laughs> They need, first of all, they need to chill out on the melodrama, not try to do it as much. Because when you overdo it, it's not as impactful. It, you become callous to it. It begins to lose its power. It's like they're trying too hard to bank off of that. And it, it's just, it makes you cold to it. It makes you used to it. And therefore less powerful. And the other thing, when they do do it, they overplay their hand. They, it hasn't really been earned. They do it a lot with characters that we don't feel that close to or situations that we don't feel that close to. And plus, as I said, they overdo it where if they simplified and had it short and succinct, it would actually be a lot more powerful. Uh, So that also, in my opinion, was a huge pitfall uh, of season two. But that being said, uh, getting more into the tone of the show, I think the tone worked really well, much better in season one. Because first of all, and you can tell us a lot in the first episode of the season, that they made a huge effort to make the show a lot lighter, make it uh, not so dark, make it appear more like Star Trek. And there's several episodes in particular that I would, when I'm reviewing it, I constantly argued that this is Star Trek. This is what Star Trek feels like. So people who say, oh, Discovery is not Star Trek, are totally incorrect. Uh, I, I think this this season did better than the first in capturing that feel of Star Trek. Some episodes in particular, I think, were classic Trek episodes, like the New Eden episode or uh, the one when they get a Talos Four. Those those feel like Star Trek and capture the essence of what Star Trek is. Um, but and this and I li- actually like how the season's a bit more intense. I like the some of the battle sequences and how uh, usually good at keeping suspense, but sometimes they're better than others at doing this. Like the first episode with Gun Asteroid, that was really suspenseful. Or the episode where Arium's attacking them and Burnham doesn't want to kill her. That was super effective. That was really suspenseful. Really intense. 
Uh, but now that episode is like the one with the Baul and the uh, Kelpians, and they're trying to, uh, the Baul or whatever the hell they're called, <laughs> and the Kelpians, and they're trying to uh, fight them off. I think they overdid it a bit uh, with the suspense, and it was too rushed, so it didn't really work. And the final episode was just explosion diarrhea. I didn't feel invested what was going on, so the suspense uh, didn't work. But when the suspense was good, it was really good. <laughs> and. Melodrama has, as I said, some, again, sometimes has worked. Uh, uh, I think the Spock and uh, Burnham relationship were very well, and other times it didn't. I would say mostly it didn't because they overdid it. Now, so the next thing I want to get into is the characters. Because um, I think the characters, to me, the character stories have always been the strength of the show, uh, even in season one. And uh, sometimes, like with the bridge crew and the minor characters, they don't do as much as they could or they should. Uh, but for me, the characters were definitely a highlight of season two. Pike, in particular, was such a good character. He was such a good captain. Uh, Anson Mount did an amazing job playing him. I think a lot of people are now asking for a Pike spinoff. I want to see it. I'd much rather see a Pike spinoff than a Section 31 spinoff. I don't care about Section 31. Um, I think just the way they did this character has someone who was coming on to the Discovery and they were a bit weary of him because they had to deal with Lorca, but he was aware of this and he was being friendly, trying to make him at ease. And at first they were sort of butting heads a little bit, uh, learning to you know know each other. But once they did, they got into a groove. And you could tell that Pike was just like, he's. A, I think he's almost, I would almost be ready to say he's the best captain and uh, has ever been portrayed in Star Trek. Now, I'm not saying he's my favorite captain. My favorite captain is Picard. But the best Starfleet captain. Um, not the best character, but the best captain. Like, his captain, uh, his command skills, the way he commands, his command style, I would say, is exactly the kind of command style a Starfleet officer should have. I love the way he was portrayed. He was definitely a huge highlight of the show. Burnham... <sighs> I liked her relationship with Spock. I think that was definitely one of the strong points of the show, which surprised me because I didn't really want Spock to be on the show because this is the whole thing. I don't want them to rely too much on established characters. I think it's a bit lazy and a bit cheap. But if they're going to do it, they do it. And once they did do it, uh, it actually worked. It worked uh, amazingly well uh, for the show. Uh, because and I, because I, the relationship they portrayed of them, you know, not liking each other and having this hand, and Burnham wants to impress Spock, but Spock still holds a lot of resentment towards her. But then the way she slowly starts to earn uh, his respect, I think, really worked. And by the end of it, totally bought that he would be that they had this connection again. That they, he was willing to do anything for her. I think that was a well earned. Uh, relationship, uh, even if they did overdo the goodbye a little bit. Um, but Burnham and her mother, as again, as I said, I wasn't as interested in that. Uh, but I think overall, so Burnham, for the most part, I think, was a good character uh, this season. Maybe not as good as she was in season one, but because they did overdo it with focusing on her, her being the Red Angel, and her flying with the rainbows in the background and finale. I think that was a bit overboard. Uh, the show doesn't always be about her. I think the show would be better if it wasn't always about her as much. Like other Star Trek shows, when they focus too much on one or two characters, it the show loses something. It's better... Uh, if you give, if you spread the love around, and she's just another character who's very interesting, well thought out, but by over hyper hyper focusing on her, actually is a detriment uh, to her character story. Now Spock, as I said, I really enjoyed his character. I was surprised because I didn't want Spock to be on board at first. I kept comparing him to uh, Leonard Nimoy, but eventually I stopped because I just come to expect this character, I to accept this character for who he was because he was so well acted, he was so well written, uh, his character story worked. Uh, I didn't think may, I still think it would have been better if they just came up with new characters and Sarek and, and Spock instead of. You know, relying on established characters, trying to do fan service. Uh, but since that's what they did do, I think they did amazingly well. 
And Saru, I liked him better in Season 2. I had a lot of issues with him in Season 1. For those who saw my Season 1 review, uh, he came off better. I think them retconning him to say, oh, now he's not hes not a prey, now he's a predator. Uh, that's a total retcon. It's not what they were thinking of in Season 1. Uh, so it bothers me. Maybe not a lot. Like, I still, I would say, we're all I like Saru. <sighs> but, I don't know. Jet Reno was a really good, interesting character, a really huge dynamic to the show. I wish they would have done more with her, uh, honestly, because she was one of the signals that led them to her, so I think she should have had more of an impact in the uh, finale, in the end of the season. But what we did get of her really worked. Now, Stamets, the whole storyline was Stamets and Colburn, because Colburn was brought back to life. I didn't really have an issue with that, actually. Glad to see this character again. And I kind of liked the dynamic of them at first, because Stamets was like, oh, everything is going to go back to normal. I had my lover back, but Colburn was like, I was dead, and now I'm alive, and I'm kind of a new person. Uh, so I actually thought that storyline worked very well. There were some, you know, downsides of it. Like, I think they kind of overdid it towards the end when Coburn went to Iron Will Cornwall and asked for good advice. I was getting a bit weary <laughs> of that storyline. But I'm glad that they got back together in the end. I think that makes a lot of sense uh, for the character. I think I've heard a lot of interpretations of Coburn, which I disagree with, saying that he's a totally different person. I don't think he's a different person. I think it's better described as a different version of the same person. It's like uh, like a snake shedding its skin. Like it's got a new body or whatever. Uh, but it's basically, he's basically has the same emotions and is the same person. But he's been through this, this trauma, this strange trauma that he can't even understand. And that's why he was a bit cold to statements. And, and so I totally bought it and I thought it really worked. Now, Tilly... I don't know. Some people really hate Tilly. I don't hate Tilly, but I think she can be annoying. Sometimes I think they overdo it with her being uh, awkward and whatever and just blurting out things. And sometimes I wish... Uh, it seems to me that they outplayed this in season two, which I didn't like. And plus, why are they calling her like a cadet? Why is a cadet being a main... I complained about that in season one anyway. And of course, like the whole thing. I mean, the whole thing with her seeing her childhood friend turns out to be this alien. I mean, I don't totally hate that storyline. It was fine, whatever. <sighs> anyway. So basically, yeah, season two of Discovery, I did like. But there were definitely some uh, pitfalls, some structural issues, I think was my main issue with it and also the it had a, the melodrama that wasn't earned. I think that's the main thing uh, they need to work on going forward is fixing this, overdoing the melodrama. And I think with the structures, probably once they, because of all the behind the scenes issues is the main result of that. So if they get that settled in season three and have a new showrunner, uh, and things run more smoothly, I think that will translate to a better pace, better structure. So, my rating for Star Trek Discovery Season 2 out of 10 is a 7, uh, very good. Uh, which is the same rating I gave to Season 1, although I would say this is slightly better than Season 1. Although it had the potential to be way better than Season 1. There were some episodes, some characters like Pike... Uh, some storylines, uh, like the Tel Telosians, uh, that were like much better than anything in, in Season 1. And it had the potential to be an amazing season, to be one of the best of Star Trek. And they squandered that potential. Uh, they came up with conclusions that did not match. That's a problem, though. When you're doing a season like this, when you're building something up forever, you, what is the range? Or what are these red signals? What is it? What is it? So you have to deliver on a huge payoff to justify all that setup. And unfortunately, I don't think they did. I think the, the payoff fell a bit short of that. It wasn't totally horrible, don't get me wrong. It wasn't a completely bad payoff, but it did not quite justify all the setup. So I, and another thing I've heard some people saying is that Discovery needs to get rid of this whole 
mystery format. Like, I think definitely keep the serialized format, keep everything matters. That's one of the things I like about Discovery. I like the serialized format in general. I think more shows should adapt it. I think Deep Space Nine should have adapted it more. I think Voyager had uh, many issues because it refused to adapt this format. So I like that Discovery has a format, but I think maybe they need to get rid of the whole mystery thing, the whole let's build something up to some great reveal, like uh, season one. It's like, oh, the reveal of Dorcas from the Mary Universe. Oh, the reveal that Ash Tyler's Vogue. Like, and this season, was like, oh, the reveal that the Red Angel is Michael Burnham. Oh, the reveal that she set the uh, signals. Oh, the reveal that uh, the Kelpians are actually predators. Like, that's what I need. I think they need to let go of that. That's not really working for them, and it's hard to pull off, and I, I don't think the show is at a place where it's able to pull something like that off. Uh, so that's what I think the show needs to work on uh, in the future, which is funny because the show is going to be set in the future, which is a good start because they can start anew. <laughs> so I do have hope for that. So that's it for my review of Star Trek Discovery Season 2. I will be back here, of course, when Star Trek uh, Discovery Season 3 comes out, and even before that to cover the Picard show. But in the meantime, I'll be covering many... Uh, other Star Trek uh, videos. I'll be covering Star Trek Enterprise, every episode of Star Trek Enterprise starting next month. And I just finished covering every episode of Star Trek Deep Space Nine, so be sure to check that out. Also, check out my channel as I do many other videos and other shows like Game of Thrones, um, The Expanse, Lost, and more. So be sure to subscribe so you can keep up with all of that. And thanks a lot for watching.